Thanks for joining us, bro. It's great to have you. Uh, Yarin's the CEO and founder of Veros. He's a close partner of Veros's to Darkroom. Um, and we use the technology. I definitely uh, suggest everyone check it out. It's a market analysis and benchmarking tool. Um, and Yarden, I've heard you kind of liken it to Bloomberg uh, in the financial world for uh, marketing and, and advertising companies. Um, would you say that's right? Yeah, yeah. I think you know, no, no comparison is is perfect, but uh, but that's a good good one liner. I mean, ba- basically, it's uh, it it helps you uh, it helps an e commerce brand understand how they stack up uh, against their direct competitive set. Uh, and understand if a uh, you know spike was due to them or was due to the market, uh, and then you know they can act on on the insights that they get from there. So you're kind of like the oracle of direct to consumer in a way. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I'd call it the oracle, but but I think we definitely have a a bird's eye view of 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 what's going on and the the true the the true stories that are happening and not the anecdotal ones that. Uh, that people are hearing. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you just sent out this email this morning. It was, uh, the title of the email was bull market alert. D to C shows continued growth and efficiency in 2024. So I want to talk about some of the findings and insights. Um, and then also just like leverage some anecdotes that I've been seeing in the ecosystem, which definitely I would say reaffirm this email, but it's nice to see that in a, in a title. It's like, for the past 18 months, we've just been seeing the shittiest news about direct-to-consumer, yeah. about the market, the economy, wars. So this was good to see this morning. Look, the truth is, is like I sat by my computer and I was thinking personally about that title. And I said, like, it may be read the wrong way. I mean, there are companies struggling and things like that. But I wanted, to, I think the sentiment is so low right now like the 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 vibe the feelings the the you know the tweets that are out there it's it's so negative but in reality it's it's actually positive uh like it, what what's going on and you know Veros tries to be the opposite of of anecdotal but when Veros talks to individual brands and we've got you know 6000 brands and we talk to them all the time they're actually saying yeah we're having a good year i mean mo- most are uh, on an individual basis uh actually doing well and we see that in the numbers. So, uh, you know, from a revenue perspective, uh, seven figure brands are up uh, over 40%, up 45% year over year. You know, throughout 2020, that's in March, throughout 2024, uh, it's it's a little lower, like 35, 40%. Eight and nine figure brands are up nearly 20% uh, year over year. It's um, interesting though, look at that. Look at that contribution from repeat the yeah. customers. Yeah. And I'm just going to read this for everyone on the on the podcast. So right. for seven figure brands, total revenue is up 45% year over year. Like Yarden said, new revenue is contributing 29% of that gain and returning yeah. revenues up 69%. Uh, across how many businesses is this Yarden? Uh, so, so the total data set is 6,000 brands, the Shopify, like seven figures. I, I don't know the exact number, but it's, you know, at least. 500 probably more wow okay and then eight and nine figure brands are up 18 percent. that's total revenue from their e-commerce channel this is direct to consumer only from shopify correct? from their shopify Shop. and it's up five percent from new revenue and returning revenues up 61 percent. so yeah big contributions from recurring revenue makes sense that smaller brands have more contribution from new customers since they need to grow top line and yeah, it's easier to grow when you're a smaller brand, but 18% growth across the category is pretty good. So just to double click on that, was that 500? This is from 500 brands or is this six, the 6,000? So, so, so sorry. So like the, so, so 6,000 is the total data set in Veros. When we look at Shopify data for seven figure brands, uh, that's like, you know, a subset uh, of that. And I can pull that exact number, but it's between 500 to a thousand is like in that, you know, sliver. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so that's great. That's actually, these are like, 
really positive indicators. Um, yeah, it is the re the repeat revenue is like a yellow flag in a way because you know obviously uh, you need you, you can't just customers. rely on the repeat revenue. Like you're not going to grow your business from you know the, the the same customer just buying and buying again. Uh, so you do need to fill that top of funnel. Uh, and you know, the numbers wouldn't be as positive if, if they weren't being helped so much by the repeat revenue, but the, the new revenue is also up. It's not that it's down. I mean, if it was down, that'd be, you know, there's a, yeah, there's, uh, there's a real yellow slash red flag there. Yeah. But Hey, it might be a leading indicator of future stalled growth. Yeah. Honestly, from my perspective, that's where. It makes sense. Most businesses, as they start to grow, they focus a lot, obviously, on client retention because that's what good businesses are built on. Yeah. The brands that over-index on retention, though, as a stopgap for their inability to continue to scale new revenue, those those businesses have really, really tough growing pains in the future. Yeah. I've seen that time and time again. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's you need both. You just need you just you just need both. And I think one of the you know one of the theories that we have around this of why the repeat revenue is up so much is because with the adoption uh, of Advantage Plus and Pmax, it's becoming a lot harder to not like it's becoming a lot harder to sort out between new and existing customers and you know with with the platforms pushing to all these customers uh th they're trying to get the lowest hanging fruit and the lowest hanging fruit is the repeat uh purchases and so there's a lot more spend going uh to those um and you know sometimes i think even if you put the caps it there's some version that that's happening and that's the theory is you know we're trying to prove that more and more with, with, with the data but uh, I think, you know, as we see the adoption grow to, to these, you know, total platform have the, have the, you know, uh, ball in their hands to, to go pick the customers that'll keep happening. And these percentage increases, um, are these, this is like new revenue as opposed to last year. So like if yeah. I did 5 million in new revenue last year, uh, I'm doing 6 mil this year. So I'm up, you know, whatever that is, 17%. Uh, yeah, 10%. exactly. Like, let's say, let's say the numbers for March hold uh, eight and nine figure brands are up nearly 20%. That means that if you did uh, $10 million uh, last year, you would do 120 million, uh, 12 million this year. Yeah, that makes sense. One thing that I look at, uh, I'm just trying to share my screen. One thing we look at when we're like assessing client health is we look at this cohorting chart, C3. I think I've showed you this before, Yarden, actually. Yeah. Um, but it basically just shows like customers acquired uh, in different cohorts and then we shade them different colors by the year in which they were acquired. So you can see like, all right, this business uh, is really acquiring, it's retaining a, you know, a certain percentage of their customers that they acquired in 2015 Yeah, like, for a long time. These are super, like Reddit's super still going. Customers. Yeah, exactly. So this obviously makes it easier because you have a foundation on which to grow. Um, so every year you want to see new customer acquisition increase ever so slightly, even if it's a smaller and smaller margin, that's fine. Um, and if you have, you know, a highly consumable product or good repeat mechanics, you know, you can start to stack revenue. And yeah. I love breaking down revenue compositions in this way because you can start to see um, the real drivers of, of revenue for your business, either from a customer behavioral perspective, a customer uh, a product perspective, um, or, you know, the different times when different customers buy, maybe it's quarterly or other sort of seasonal components. Yeah. That's um, an amazing, amazing visual. Like you, you, like you talk about like having a strong base of returning customers, like you can literally see the base see in, in that, right? Like that's growing. Yeah. So this is like a first order visualization that we do to assess the health of a business. It's no surprise. In the agency space, especially when you're focused like we are on paid acquisition, uh, a lot of the customers that you talk to have problems yeah. with paid acquisition. So they're yeah. like, they're seeking solutions. Um, and it usually has to do with downward gravity on new customer acquisition. So you do a visualization of this and you, you can just do this through by getting access to Shopify. And you can see, <laughs> all right, what has the general trajectory of the business been? Um, 
over the past five years and you can see the health of the business and what sort of foundation their 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 kind of uh their revenue has been built on yeah as you dig in you dig in deeper and deeper here you can uncover you know the reasons why revenue might be declining why they've been growing uh recurring repeat revenue so much is it because of a, a couple of SKUs? um is it because of key customer cohorts um, and that I think allows you to be a lot more scientific about growth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to just talk about, so markets back, you saw this today, you chose to publish that email today. Um, what have you been seeing for the past 18, 18 months? Yeah. Look, I mean, it's, it's hard to, it, it's, it's, it's confusing, right? Because you have, you have the COVID era, which was a boom. Okay. And yeah, then I could talk about this forever too. Yeah. And then, you know, things kind of normalized. Uh, by normalized, I mean, you know, went down, uh, like, to reality. Um, and, and and then, and, you know, Meta and Google were kind of learning in the new, in the new period. And there were, there were issues here and there, but Meta really had its heyday. Uh, like, like, it's doing, you know, it's been doing really well and gaining a ton of share wallet uh, in the past year and a half. But we haven't been seeing revenue increases like this, and, and we didn't see that in 2023, um, which is the point of, of the email in 2024 that, you know, things are starting to build uh, back up on, on themselves and may not get back to COVID era, but, you know, the businesses are, are growing. And something that I've been saying is that that's really, really important to note is people spend 2023 as a year of, of profitability, a year of, you know, efficiency, Profitability. How do we, uh, you know, reduce headcount? How do we, uh, you know, reduce spend in different places? And that put them in a situation that now they have this, you know, way more efficient base than they did years ago. Uh, and the markets are back to growing. So the markets are back to growing. Things are getting more efficient on uh, the paid media side, uh, and that puts brands in in an optimistic situation. Yeah, for sure. I think the, I mean, from my perspective, 2023 was just like bare, like flat market. And, yeah. um, you know, I think that was really difficult. A lot of businesses were recalibrating. I think from your perspective, just going back, Yarden, like saying it's really confusing. When you, what do you mean by that? Like, it's just, you're seeing so many different sort of data points um, that it's what hard I to mean kind by of- that, it's like, like when, when, when we look at, when we look at 2022 and 2023, I mean, what are we comparing it to? You know, like those are bad years compared to 2021. Um, but like 20, 2021, from my perspective, like when we talk to clients and they're like, 2021, we need to get back to that sort of growth. It was an anomaly. Like it just was. was yeah, like- exactly. So you look at 2022 and like 2023, these were in a way bare years right? Because you're comparing them to recent periods uh, and people had scaled. So like they start like the, the economics don't work anymore uh, in, in this time. Um, but it probably was just like normal years for reality. But now why I'm saying, you know, bull market 2024 is not that there's not yellow flags and it's not that, the, you know, things are back to COVID, but it's basically, you know, people have recalibrated their business, as you say. Uh, you know, they, they've got to focus on efficiency. They've got to focus on repeat uh, customers as well. But top line uh, is starting to grow year over year and they're starting, you know, to able to rescale. And that, that is why I'm optimistic uh, yeah. about, about the space. There's obviously a ton of problems in, in the space and about profitability here. But, but the numbers like point to a good direction. Yeah, I think generally, I think it depends on the business, but generally e-commerce is a tough, it's a tough business selling products online, especially when you have many SKUs. The best businesses that do it well, they have, they're focused on a few SKUs or one SKU. They have high repurchasability or subscription and like they can kind of build operations around that and scale. Um, what have you been also- seeing with subscription? Like, I'm curious from your from your side. Like, we don't look at that in the data too much. I mean, like, have this subscription e-com world has that taken off? Has it worked? I, from my point of view, the best 
e-commerce businesses are subscription businesses. Um, but can most if, if it's if it's a subscription that's not being forced to right that, that was my yeah so like a really good example sorry to interrupt chris um i uh was just i just had a arjun and ryan from jolie on the podcast yeah. uh and i mean they have one SKU, high margin um <laughs> it it has 90 day subscription built into it if you install that in your shower and you use it every you're literally going to use it every day you're going to need filters every three months like otherwise like kind of defeats the purpose and the price of it it's it's 11 bucks a month it's 33 dollars every 90 days so if you truly believe hey this is cleaning my skin this is making me look better this is a beauty product you're going to spend that that's like right. well, the way they've engineered that business and this is what we talked a lot about at the podcast you should check it out, um, was how that, like, that is a really, really solid business model. Right. I mean, that's As the opposed razor to, and the razor blade, right? That's the same. Yeah. As opposed to Ryan's last business, sneakers, greats, like we talked about this, how many different sizes and styles do you yeah. need to create? How much spillage and waste and returns are just inherently baked into that business model? So I think founders, like, two things you really need to figure out is, like, what's going to be a great business model that works for you. And then I think the second thing that's also equally as important is where is there white space in a market that is mm -hmm. ideally growing. And I think if you do those, those things, right, you can potentially have COVID years every year. Um, yeah. we still see brands that are having crazy, you know, triple digit growth every year. And yeah. it's not because they launched during COVID it's because there's a ton of white space in the market and they have product market fit. Yeah. That's true. Sorry, Chris. No, I was just going to say, I think that the during, you know, kind of 2020, 2021, you saw like a lot of brands trying to force subscription into their business model. And then it, I think people just started to get really annoyed with it, like on the consumer right. side. Uh, but now it seems to be that the brands that are doing well do have subscription tied in. But to Lucas's point is 100% like a core component of the business, not like a, not just like, oh, it's a value add for it. So um, the example that I can use is uh, there's a there's a company that I subscribe from for wipes um, and uh, for for my kids not for me and uh, you know that 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 is inherently like a subscription based model that you need for parents and I think that that's great uh, but there was another time when uh, when we first had kids that it it seemed like the calculus on what they made available for how often you subscribed was like way off so it was it was bags for our diaper pail and like it would come with like 500 bags and they wanted you to, to they only offered uh, a, a 90 day subscription. And you're like, dude, I'm not, how many diapers do you think I'm right. utilizing in that time period? And we subscribed to it for like two months or, or you know, two, six, I guess it would be, you know, six months in the end. And it was just like, we didn't need diapers again for, you know, five years. So it just felt forced into the equation at that, that point. That to me is going back to just like common sense marketing. It's like, subscription is it going to work for the product like if you're a founder and don't know that like you haven't been talking enough with your customer or know your product well right enough. um so i think that's just where when when it gets to e-com i think people like kind of get a bit more desensitized from like actual life they're like thinking about metrics and numbers and they're like oh yeah subscription that would be great people will subscribe to this they just kind of like miss the point sometimes of like First of all, subscription should be more of like a conversation. Like it shouldn't feel forced to be like, hey, listen, if you're ordering this a lot, maybe you should subscribe yeah. and you'll get some sort of savings on on, ha on having a subscription. Um, so that's how I think about it. Um, Yarn, and I'm yeah. interested just from you. So you, you guys are getting into more of the creative uh, domain. Um, yeah. Obviously, creative is so important to performance. It's like yeah. uh, the lion's share of what we do at the agency and what we talk about and um, I think what everyone recognizes is important. I know you're starting to beta test some products, uh, and expand into that domain. Tell us your thought process about that. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take a genius to see that creative is kind of the last lever that you're going to be able to pull in terms of, uh, in terms of performance and efficiency uh on, on the ad channels and the interesting thing about veros is we actually you know we literally see uh what creatives are uh are the highest performing uh across a whole category 
Um, and, you know, we're trying to find ways, uh, smart ways and safe ways to really help, you know, the category uh, become more efficient and build creatives that, you know, to have more winners. Because right now uh, in the space, to make a winner is too hard. To make a, to find a winning creative is too much of a crab shoot. It doesn't happen enough. Uh, and if we can, if we can fix that, uh, we will. And so, you know, now we're, we're, uh, in a closed beta, um, where basically what we're doing is, uh, it's like a double opt-in. So the, a brand on Veros needs to, uh, agree that they want to be part of this, uh, creative co-op, which we call it. Uh, and then uh, basically they can all, uh, all the brands that are in it, other than guardrails that you can't see for your own category, you can see the highest performing creatives of other brands um, in, in this co-op uh, based off actual performance metrics. So based off, you know, percent of spend as a percent of total of the ad account or row ads or cost per purchase, click through rate, you can see what videos have the highest hooks and then go take out those hooks. So it's literally like you see the winning creatives and you can go take inspiration or go remake those um, if you want. And like I am very bullish on that. I, I think that it's going to be uh, the way to go. Um, and, you know, I think it's like uh, not zero sum at all. I think it's actually like positive for for all the for all the participants. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're you know, we're, we're trialing it uh right now with you know some select brands and, and you know our goal is for them to get two winners a month out of uh out of the usage of this you know it's really interesting some some things that sometimes when i audit uh different sort of meta accounts and ad libraries for particular industries like i see okay. basically the same exact ad libraries i call it commoditized creative i see the same ad libraries yeah that competing products are running. It's like the yeah. same sort of hooks, the same sort of UGC ads, really the same value propositions. And a lot of these brand founders are not looking at their creative library. Yeah. Or they are looking at their creative library. Some aren't, but they're not looking at their competitors' creative libraries as like yeah. diligently as we are. And uh, it just begs the question of like how important it might be to just be super differentiated from the style of your ads also to the things yeah. that you're talking about. But look, I mean, even when you look at you look at competitive ad library, I mean, the problem is, right, is that, and I think this is also one of the problems of when you say like it becomes commoditized is like, okay, you look at your compare's ads, he's got a hundred ads, okay, only two of those are winners. Other ninety eight are like mediocre. Or they're testing through. Now you're gonna look at the hundred ads, say, oh, that ad looks cool, right? That ad feels like it's gonna work, or that's easy to remake. <laughs> I'm gonna go remake those, and so everyone is kind of remaking other people's ads, but they're not making remaking on actual performance metrics. Uh, they're remaking it on like eyeballing. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. And, so you're basically like, Hey, these are the top performers. Why? Like that's, you know, we can just, we can figure not out my job. Yeah. <laughs> that's your job. Yeah. But seriously, what I would do is say, okay, the, let's break down why these are top performers. And yeah. there's definitely frameworks for that it has to do with the hook some sort of problem solution statement or like wait, there's many different ways to break down ads. And then I would just create new formats, like steal those, steal those ads, create totally new formats to display them creatively um, and see how those do. Um, yeah. For me, brands need to one, get, get the, 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 they need to figure out what their format of ad is. Like it needs to be yeah. stylistically different. That's like a branding and design exercise. And then they need to create ads that actually convert, which is what you're going to help them, sh you know, you know, show them how to do. Yeah, yeah. And I think, look, I think it like, like the important thing here is a lot of times with with Veros, I you know when when I'm walking people through their dashboards, like we we see what their problem is, you know, because it's like a very simple dashboard of like you've got ROAS and cost per purchase, which is like you know your end goal. And then you have the funnel of CPM, click through, cost per click, conversion, um, AOV, and, and spend. And you can understand, like, you, it highlights in red, you know, where you are, like, per metric, red, yellow, green, compared to your competitive set. And the places that you have red, uh, let's say, you know, ROAS is red, and then in the funnel. So let's say click through rate is red, you know that that's what you need to fix. And so if someone needs to fix click through rate, you can go into here. 
and you can see, okay, well, what creatives have the highest click through rate? Or if you, you know, zoom in to videos and you say, uh, yeah, actually my videos, the problem, uh, isn't, you know, the average watch time. It's not the 50% view throughs. It's, it's actually the hook then. Okay. I need a better hook. Um, and so like, or, you know, I want lower CPMs. Let me see what creatives are bringing lower CPMs. And so you can, you can really like figure out what's broken when you're in the core Veros platform and then get into creative of figuring out how to solve that problem. That makes sense. Oh, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, I think what, what's really exciting about this kind of like era of, of the cross section of data and creativity is like, I, I think we swung the pendulum so far during like the growth hacking era that like creative got really crappy. Um, but now it seems like we're able to actually utilize the data to make things interesting. And so we're kind of getting back to a place where creatives become fun again, not so boring. And speaking as a marketer, like not boring to participate in. You know, five years ago, it's just, it felt really boring and like the art was taken out of it. They're, you know, so I'm, I'm excited to see how people are utilizing the data to yeah. do that now. Jordan, I see yeah. that TikTok year over year, CPMs are up 54%. Um, that's not that surprising, right? Um, more people are adopting advertising as a platform and their demand has probably stayed the same pretty much because the platform hasn't grown that much. I don't think this year it's kind of like flattened out a little bit. Um, am I thinking about that? Right. It, yeah. I think TikTok is an evolving, evolving ad platform. I, I think oh, that the spend is down actually. Yeah. So CPM is up down. and spend is so, down. So I think, look, I think people are looking at TikTok in, in new, new ways. First of all, uh, you know, as we as we spoke about, it's becoming a year of, of more efficiency, uh, both this year and last year. So and, and part of what that means is, you know, scale back all the testing and, and all the new things and do what, you know, do what, you know, brings money, uh, which is really, you know, usually meta and, and partially Google um, and not not necessarily, you know, the other channels. So people are scaling down from that perspective. But people are learning to work with TikTok in new ways. It's not just just ads. You know, they're learning to work with affiliates. Um, you know, we did an analysis of TikTok shops, uh, and TikTok shops is growing really fast. But it's still really small. But but on the ad side, of TikTok shops it's growing really fast. And so you know, TikTok has had a problem uh, over the years that I think everyone knows, which is uh, they're under attributing uh, they're under attributing conversions, and it's very hard. Uh, it's very hard to, you know, prove out to the top level of the company uh, that this is bringing in back direct money. Uh, and so it kind of gets uh, scaled down. Uh, yeah, I think that's changing, though. Like most of our conversations, it's very clear in from our vantage point that if you're a brand and you have really strong, measurable growth on TikTok, through individual videos uh, from an engagement or a view perspective or shares and saves, which are, are two really important organic metrics to look at. You can start to actually build, build a following relatively quickly and you can attribute growth uh, and success of some of those organic assets uh, to yeah. Amazon sales um, and sometimes to direct consumer sales as well. But I think the silver lining actually in building a, an organic function that's like producing high quality video content really quickly for Reels and for TikTok is you get a, a really solid fertile ground to test new ad assets that you know are going to perform on Facebook and Instagram and Meta when you run them because they're in highly consumable formats that are native to the platforms, i.e. what we typically know as UGC. So that's how we're counseling our clients. It's like, I think having an organic function is such an asset to brands today. Um, yeah. and, and people are starting to understand that even if they can't attribute, uh, you know, a certain amount of purchases like they do in ads manager to, you know, TikTok organic, or, you know, obviously what we're talking about now is TikTok ads. Yeah, um, no, that makes total sense. I mean, and like o overall, I, I'm actually very optimistic in terms of like TikTok as a channel for, for D to C just because. They're doing a lot of things. Like I think that they're playing it smartly. I think that you know originally when when TikTok ads kind of became uh, 
relatively uh, a, a common a common thing. You know, right now they have like five, ten percent, uh, five to ten percent of share of wallet that we track. When we came out the the hardest thing was uh, making creative that's relevant for them, right? You know, all these companies uh, are really good at making creative on Meta, but now you have to make you know completely different style creative to go with TikTok. So it was a little bit of a big lift to 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 get started there, and then TikTok came out of the creative center to make it a lot more helpful. And, and they came out with a really good platform uh, to help you there. And you, now a lot of the spend is uh, going towards brand uh, and it's like a, hard, a little bit harder to attribute. So they're coming out with TikTok shops where you can say, hey, here's how many, here's how many orders you got. And it all, it all stays on TikTok's platform. And that's probably how the people there want to consume it more. And they're going more towards an Amazon style. So they're they're actually doing a lot of things and like i think that they're they're pulling it together and tying everything together really well between organic and affiliates and ads uh and shops uh and and they're doing a lot of smart things so these numbers are like a little bit red but i i don't think that they're telling the whole story uh in terms of what's going on on the platform are are you gonna start reporting more on tiktok shops and because i agree like ads are just a it's a part of what they do they're going for yeah. the holy grail where you have this closed loop ecosystem where you can run ads, you can buy products and you have kind of affiliate baked in. It's they can, I think it's going to be a, I think they're going to be able to execute on it like a hundred percent in a way that yeah. Instagram wasn't able to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. And to your question, I mean, so, so we actually just modeled the data out this month. And so it'll be in the dashboard probably next month. But but yeah, I think it's an important. We'll also report on Meta Shops, like like we we modeled them together because we we really wanted uh, to compare them, and it's interesting. I mean, uh, TikTok Shops now driving a lot higher ROAS uh, than than Meta Shops is. What does the volume look like? Uh, I think everyone's just so curious what? in these early days of TikTok Shop. It's way smaller than you'd expect. I mean, let me pull up. Uh, let me pull up the actual data here, but. It's, it's, I mean, I was surprised by how much people are talking about it and how, how much smaller from the, from an ad perspective, because like, like, again, I think, you know, people are pushing organic or affiliates to it. You're just talking about ad. from a spend, not a revenue perspective. Yeah, exactly. So from a spend perspective, um, the total spend that we track, um, is about, uh, like seven hundred thousand dollars, it's be it's nearly a million dollars a month, let's say, um, on TikTok shops. Where just for context, uh, on Meta shops we track fifty million dollars a month. Okay, so so it's still small. Now, and you know the median spend of the advertisers that are on TikTok shops on Veros are spending around. Uh, eight thousand dollars a month which is you know not nothing but it's not uh again the median spend on meta shops for this color is sixteen thousand yeah uh, a month so yeah. the volume is still low it's still it's still early but you know could change <laughs> could change fast i think the sentiment from like four months ago to this month uh for certain types of merchants like <laughs> TikTok shop requires like, it just requires a different muscle. You need to figure it out and kind of blend a lot of these different skills together. Uh, but I'm seeing revenue trend in a really positive direction for some of the brands that figure it out. Um, yeah. They have good I organic mean, strategies. They're getting affiliate lifted. They're focusing on ads. Like they're, they're starting to drive hundreds of thousands of dollars through the platform. Exactly. And it's a, it's, it's, it's kind of a web. And, and if you figure it out, it's, it's, it's really powerful. And I think it'll become more powerful. And, you know, we've seen it with every one of these platforms that the money is made early on, like, and then it, you know, it gets kind of commoditized. And yeah, you need to be a superhero to you can still make it work. But you have to, you know, it gets a lot harder. There are uh, incentives to figure things out early when your competition isn't doing it. Honestly, if I'm a brand founder, I'm trying to figure out how to, if my product works for TikTok shop, I'm trying to figure that out as much as I can. Yeah. It's just too big of an opportunity when you're fighting, take meta, 
against other competitors who are spending a lot more than you on the platform. Totally, totally, totally. And you know, it's 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 a bet, and bets uh, bets work out. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do. But I yeah. love uh, Nick Shackelford on, on Twitter says a lot. Scared money don't make money. I love that line. <laughs> it's true, man. It's true. Yeah. Um, and we could, you know, I think I think it's also worth mentioning. Like, there's a lot of talk right now about like issues and in, in degradation on on Meta from the, from since February. I don't know how much, uh, you know, how many clients uh, on the dark room side have, have been uh, uh, worried about that. Um, but, you know, we looked a lot into that in, in the data. And the, the story, uh, the story of what's happening is the story on social media is the end of the world. Um, but the truth is, is that actually it's like a little bit of the end of the world for a few companies. So 13% of the companies that we track are significantly uh, deteriorated on a ROAS basis, which is a deterioration of more than 25%. Um, but on, on the most part, uh, brands weren't so affected. I mean, actually on a, on a median perspective, uh, spend was up 40% on Meta and ROAS was uh, only down 3%, which is actually like putting up really good numbers from an ad platform perspective, you know, when you consider the, the increase of scale. Uh, so, you know, fr from what we've seen in, in the data, there's some brands that got really affected, um, but it's definitely not the majority. Um, and for those brands, it's unclear why uh, they, they got affected. Um, and it's, you know, it's really tough to, to have that bad like bad pick and and for some reason the algorithm is is not performing for you uh and we're starting to see less and less of those like it's starting to come back a bit um uh, but like i would use your platform to say you know if you're on social media or you saw like a bloomberg article that's like meta is dying it's it's not uh it's 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 not the case in reality and it, and and the data shows that uh, like for most brands, that they should be actually in a pretty good place. I think that's a great place to, to cap us off. Yarden, thanks so much for your insight. D2C bull market is back. We're looking forward to continuing to move into 2024. Yarden, thanks so much, man.